Okay, I call the meeting back to order at 6.31 p.m. We're meeting an executive session for the purpose of discussing litigation. Um, in terms of attendance, uh, Scott Buckley, the chair, is here. Janine Imbriano is here. Mr. Rich McGowan is here. And Chris Papa Vasilio is here as well. Um, Diana Boutwell, unfortunately, could not make it. We have our, our, our superintendent and assistant superintendent on as well. Before beginning, I have to start with reading the message we've been reading pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, General Law Chapter 30A, Section 18, and the Governor's March 16, 2020 order imposing strict limitations on the number of people that may gather in one place. This meeting the North Reading School Committee is being conducted, including remote participation. No person, no in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings as provided for in the order. A reminder that persons who would like to listen to this meeting while in progress may do so. Okay. The first order of business is public input. If there is any discussion or anybody that would like to be heard on something that is not on the agenda, um, and I know we are talking mainly about the reopening, and I see some people that I know had asked some questions about spectators at athletics, and we will address that in there. But if there's anything outside of that, please put a note in the In terms of student report, I did see Shivy on here, but Shivy, are you giving the student report tonight? Yeah, I just have a question. Floor is yours. Awesome. Um, so I thought I'd give everybody a little rundown on how school is going so far, and also the student body elections which are happening this Wednesday. Um, for the senior class, we have Caroline um, we have Excuse me just a moment. If, if someone, if folks could just turn their microphones off for their um, not speaking. All right. Um, for the senior year, Caroline Casey running for vice president unopposed. We have Nestor Nordeal running for president unopposed. We have Nick Pasquale running for secretary unopposed. And we have Jacqueline Ramo running for treasurer unopposed. For junior year, we have um, Luke Benicky running for president unopposed. We have Jared McDonald and Jack Carroll both running for vice president. We have Megan Slattery running for secretary unopposed, and we have Adam Bacher running for treasurer unopposed. For the sophomore class, we have Brian Slattery running for president unopposed, um, Annie Cooperstein running for VP unopposed, we have Jenna DiNapoli running for treasurer unopposed, and Shane Hansen running for secretary unopposed. And for the freshman class, we have Cassandra Fitz, Kristen Galvin, and Marty Pierce running for president. We have Abby Lilly running for vice president unopposed. We have Bella Fisher running for secretary unopposed and Sophie Donovan running for treasurer unopposed. Um, Sultana Saparlis and Gianna Nalivo from the junior class are both running for student representative to the school committee as well. And otherwise, school has been going very well so far and it seems that all of the students have really adapted to the schedule and the rotation for all the days. So far from my peers, I've heard that a lot of people really enjoy the late start model as well as the half hybrid and half in-person model. That's all I've got for today. <laughs> Comments or questions? Rich or Chris? Nothing for me, thanks. Uh, like me. Why didn't you run for one of the class uh, honors? I'm not sure. I've always preferred to be kind of like the representative to the school committee, so I'm keeping that position. <laughs> the power Great answer. <laughs> Great answer. Thank you very much, Shivy. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to the school reopening. I turn it over to Dr. Daly to give us a rundown of how things are going. Okay, so I, I think I'll start with um, what happened over the weekend um, with our with our response to a positive case at the Hooded School. We were aware of a, a staff member that was in close contact um, on Thursday. That person then didn't come to school on Friday. 
Um, we, we did notify the public health nurse and our nurses work closely. And, you know, I just want to make sure that it's clear to everyone how, how many people are involved in all these decisions and how closely we work. Um, I'm meeting with the town administrator, the public health nurse, the director of public health, the police chief, the fire chief. We're all meeting regularly on this topic. Um, and so certainly when something like this comes up, we're in communication. I'm also um, connecting with Mr. Buckley on this and the, the principals, obviously, of the school, Mr. McKay, Dr. McKay, in this case, um, he did a fantastic job. And our nurses also, again, all weekend um, being responsive. So what happens when someone tests positive, which is what happens, so this staff member who was a close contact um, tested positive, we then begin our contact tracing process where we identify all the staff and students that the person came in contact with and also all of the places where that person uh, may have been to make sure those places are clean and sanitized. Those close contacts, again, a close contact is someone who is within um, six feet of the person for a period of between 10 to 15 minutes and that's what's assessed. In this case, those students and staff members were all identified and those students and staff are, are in a quarantine period of 14 days from um, the particular date that, that has been established based on the particulars of the, the staff member's um, situation. And so those folks all received the call, received information. We made the decision on Saturday um, to, it was late, late in the afternoon when we received this. We wanted to let people know um, that this was out there. We thought it, because it was the first case, it was also a good idea to let people know, you know, we're on top of this, here's our process. And really to get ahead of any discussion or rumors that might be out there, there was already some misinformation out there about which school this was and what had happened. Um, and so I thought it was a good idea to do that. And Mr. Buckley encouraged me to, um, to also make sure we communicated to the whole community, which I think was, was positive. Um, you know, as I mentioned head on, the difficult decision that I had that night was, you know, do I say, do I tell everyone and then people are not sure who the people are? You know, I much, I would much rather have been able to say that it's been identified and the close contacts have already been contacted. However, that hadn't happened yet and I wanted everyone to be aware. And, you know, the, the example I keep using, I didn't want someone to, you know, go visit their grandmother and then find out the next day that, by the way, they, they are now a close contact. So we, we figured rather be safe and get out ahead of this and, and really bring this, um, bring this information. So over the next 24 hours, all the close contacts were, were contacted. Everything was settled. The building was cleaned. Students were able to return to school. There was really very little, from everything that I heard today, very little disruption to our typical day. Um, students that are in the, the classroom were able to continue in the classroom. In one of the situations, just this is an example that we've received, the teacher may be out on a quarantine. Half of the cohort may be out in the quarantine. The other half of the cohort can come into the school and the teacher, if she uh, chooses to, can teach from home. And that, that is what's happening. And that has happened in other situations. The teacher's teaching from home, the, half the kids are home and the other half are gonna be in the classroom. So that, that is the situation that we will likely um, see um, as a result of this situation, but, but we would be prepared for that in others. So in a lot of ways, the way we've designed our system here, the students really aren't missing a beat. It's just where they're learning, it's just a little bit different. Um, the teacher might be home as opposed to in the classroom, the students might be home or in the classroom, um, but the learning continues. So I, I, I figured that was a good update for the first one. I don't know if there's any questions about this situation from the committee. In the chat, there was a question on siblings quarantine. I mean, it was, I think you identified it was a staff member, so there were siblings there, but do you mean siblings of people that were in the class? So siblings are not quarantined um, until, you know, it, so if, if, a, if a, let's say a, a second grader is, is in a quarantine because they're a close contact, the siblings of that um, student are not quarantined until that student is positive. And so those are the, the Department of Health protocols. You don't, you know, we, we don't start, you, you do not quarantine close contacts of close contacts. You only quarantine close contacts of people who are positive. So if, if, if a, someone else were to test positive, then a whole other process would kick in. But, um, okay. um, Janine, any questions? Mm, not really. I mean, I, I, I guess I'm, it comes from the CDC, right? That says that if 
the student who was in close contact has to quarantine. But if they have two or three brothers or sisters at home, those two or three brothers or sisters don't have to quarantine. Correct. Even though they're probably even would get closer to their brother or, you know, whatever. And so if that child that's being quarantined, the student that was the close contact, call him Bob. Yep. Um, so if Bob, within the 14 days, ends up testing positive, now you have those two other siblings that have been going to school. So the likelihood of them testing positive would most likely be now. So it is. I guess so that's it, kind of the, the question. Is, is, yeah, you know, so parents have the information. The parents can make the decision to have their, their siblings stay home or, or the parents themselves. Uh, but it is not required under any of the protocols. The amount of time where a person is actually um, contagious, right, is, is very limited. And so that the chances of that student in the quarantine, that's, that's already out of an abundance of caution that that student is even actually exposed. Again, remember that all of these students are, are you know, uh, masked, six, socially distanced, six feet apart throughout the day, and we're cleaning all the time. So, you know, th there was never a circumstance where these students were that close without masks, without all that uh, equipment. So that is the protocol. In some ways, it does sound like we should be just quarantining three levels out, but if you start doing that, you're not able to, to really function. It's not, it's not a North Reading decision. That's just the, the protocols okay. Okay. So that we're following. Yeah. For clarification. Yep. No, absolutely. It is it is something that, that we thought mm -hmm. a lot about, and that's a question I, you know, I addressed it with all the principals today because I imagine that's a question that many parents might have, um, especially if, you know, if people start to realize that it, someone is out and then you realize someone has a brother or a sister, but you know, there is no, um, that is not the protocols that CDC has. Rich, any comments or questions on this subject? Um, Patrick, can you clarify what your thoughts are in terms of communication? It seemed like you were saying that you were over communicating this time because it's the first time, I guess I, I, I guess I would, and, and you can correct me if I misunderstood that, but I guess I would say that over communication with the community is always going to be a positive. Yeah. Um, so hopefully, hopefully that communication pattern will continue if, if, uh, if, and when we have uh, other cases. Yeah, I, I would say it certainly will. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, um, the first time you do it, you don't really know what the response is going to be. <laughs> so, um, that's kind of why I phrased it that way, but but that was I was just trying to explain some of the decision making process. Yep. We we knew going in though, no matter what, we would let everybody know. Yep. Um, obviously, there's privacy concerns and there are issues. You know, to, to armchair quarterback, one thing I, I would do differently that I've already thought about, and, and we've already debriefed with the the town group, the school group, and we're going to debrief again right. on this. But one thing that I would do differently is I would be a little more specific. I used you know I used a lot of resources that are out there. There's some template language. And I use the, the phrase, you know, hood school community member, which is very much um, protects the confidentiality of the person. But I feel I could have said staff member, and that would have um, alleviated some of the concern because ch parents of children in cohort D who are fully remote, the likelihood that their child was exposed to a staff member is much less than even to a student because they were thinking, well, my student's not in school, but they may have been at dance or softball practice with another student. Um, so I think, I think if I communicated that, so that's something I might do a little bit differently in the future. These are all things we're going to think about. Uh, but again, we wanted to get this out, um, and we use very protective language to, you know, to, to, to make sure all, all involved remain confidential. So, and, and in regards to the students who are quarantining, is it, um, certain students from each cohort or is it all one cohort and how did you make that determination? So the, uh, the, the, the public health nurse and the school nurse, everyone that did the contact tracing determined where the infected, uh, the positive person was, and it had to be a situation where they were with a group within six feet of those students for uh, 15 minutes or more. So it, it affected, you know, this particular position. Um, it's not a typical classroom position. Okay. So, so this person, uh, I'm being delicate here because I don't want to. I, to I understand. Yep. Yeah. It's, it but the, wasn't, you know, it's it wasn't, a case, yeah. you know, caseload, caseloads. And so there were some smaller group cases involved. There were some other uh, circumstances and there were some visits to classrooms. And so in some cases, it was determined that, you know, that was just a, it, it was not a, a 
you know, a 15 minute exposure and in other cases it was. And so, you know, they made all those decisions based on that. You just followed the person's day and, and made the determination basically. Exactly. It's a couple of days that we review. You yep. kind of go back a few days and then they, they yep. went through. That. So yeah, it was very thorough, very thoroughly done by, by Ms. Fath. Perfect. Chris, any comments or questions? Um, none at this time. And I have none either. I appreciate the over communication. And yeah, that will continue. Perfect. Thank you. Next bus date on. All right. So COVID. I think, you know, I just, what I thought I'd be talking about tonight was the, uh, the, the, the communication around the, the color coding. And I just want to clarify that for everyone here. Um, when we saw that North Reading went into the yellow, quote unquote, from the map, um, I felt it was important at that time to let the, the community know what it would mean if we were to go into the red and, and also what it does not mean. Um, it was helpful that uh, the day after we put that out, the Department of Ed put out some clarifying information that basically backed up what, what we had shared. But essentially, the, you know, the color-coded map was created to help us define um, different levels of exposure and positive cases that should help us make decisions. But it's not a, a, a one-size-fits-all decision. So what they're saying and they continue to say is you need multiple weeks of data before you make a decision. You should not be uh, yo-yoing is the term they use back and forth between red and yellow and green and we're open, we're closed, you know, based on the numbers. In a, in a town the size of North Reading with a population of around 16,500 or so, uh, my understanding from the math that I did out of 100,000, you're talking a handful of, of cases that can make this go from green to yellow to red. Um, and so I wanted it to be clear because I, 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 I figured there are people who, if they heard that North Reading was in the red, would assume that they can't come to school the next day or it's not safe to come to school the next day because we're now red versus a week ago we were yellow. So the important message here for the community is that when you're, when you're in the yellow um, as opposed to the green, there are more cases that are happening. So we need to be more vigilant. We need to do everything that we're doing and do it uh, more effectively and, and be very aware of those rising cases. And it's something serious to take seriously. At the same time, um, if the town and the Board of Health is able to determine the, the root of those cases does not have an impact on the schools, then the schools uh, would be able to continue to be open. So in some of the surrounding districts, North Andover, for example, they were in the red. It was determined that there was, a, a, you know, isolated a lot of those uh, cases at Merrimack College didn't directly impact the schools. The schools were able to stay open. In Middleton, a lot of the cases that put Middleton into the red were contained in the jail. Again, not a direct impact on the schools. And if the schools were open, they would have been able to remain open. Um, and so similarly here. So we just wanted to communicate that out and to clarify questions that may that may be there. And um, I think that's important to do because I, I want people to understand that you know, in some ways, the school is a very safe place. Everyone here is wearing a mask, socially distanced, and there are uh, folks coming around and cleaning every touch point after you move out of there. I mean, I, you can't really say that about every um, restaurant or public place that you're in. So I, I know that when the students are here, they're, they're in a safe place. And so uh, I think everyone is committed to having students in school as much as possible. So even if we were to have, honestly, from my math, it's, it's you could have a handful of cases in the whole town that could put us into the red, but if it's determined that the schools can remain open, um, you know, we've had many discussions with, with the, the health folks from the town who would say if, if they feel the schools are still safe, then we can continue to have school. Okay. So, Mr. Mariano, any questions? Uh, Mr. McGowan? No, thank you. Mr. Papa Vasilio? Nope. Uh, Julie Kopke has a question. What specific metrics will we be considering beyond the red designation? The, so, in, for example, that if, if something were to happen in the schools, um, it's a very different situation. If we have two to three cases in the school, whether teachers, staff, or students, we would be calling in a rapid response unit. And at that point, um, there's a direct connection to the school. And so obviously we'd be making considerable um, decisions, you know, at the school or district level there. If the cases in the town were somewhat connected to the schools, parents, uh, older siblings, um, you know, th that's a very different kind of decision to, to, to make a difference there. So. I, I, I would also add even like how it's spread. 
I, I, I know that a couple of the cases that have happened recently in North Reading, they were not spread in North Reading. There were people that went outside of North Reading. They were in another state. They caught it. They came back and they quarantined. Yep. So I think a spread within North Reading is also something that's a little bit different than somebody who happens to live here or travels outside the state and then comes back with it. Okay. So, but certainly, you know, just to say again, we the metrics that the Board of Health would be using, that's who I'd be checking in with on a, you know, multiple times a day to, to get that information from them. Yeah. And, we'll, and we'll continue to communicate out. And the other thing that I would just mention is if, if the schools are open and you don't feel comfortable, that doesn't mean you have to come. I mean, anybody can decide if they don't feel comfortable for any point in time, any reason, they can decide that they want to work remotely for a week or two weeks. If somebody, if a, if a student or a family feels like, even if we're in the red for a week, if they don't feel comfortable coming to school, I would encourage them to stay home, you know, and just like if somebody doesn't feel well, like tonight we have, you know, a member of our board that doesn't feel well, so he's participating remotely right now. And so, again, people, People can make the best decision for their own family and the school makes the best decision for the overall community as best we can. But ultimately it's, you know, your call. If you don't feel comfortable, by all means that you can go remote for a week or two if, if that makes you feel more comfortable. And just to clarify, because I agree with that, but I, I did have this discussion with the principals because it has come up. Um, it should be a COVID related decision. So it should not be, I overslept today, it's much easier for me just to uh, to work from home. And that has come up, um, uh, could be at the high school, could be at the middle school. No, but it, it has come up a few times and the principals are reiterating, it is not a choice that, you know, hey, it feels like a remote day today. No, if you're in the cohort A, you should be here. If you're in the cohort B, you should be here. Um, however, if you're concerned for any reason about your health or safety or the health or safety of others, you can stay home for the short term, especially if it's gonna be an extended term, we probably should talk about officially moving into cohort D because there are people that are trying to transition in. But for the most part, the safety standpoint, what Mr. Buckley said is absolutely correct. Okay, next topic. So I think that, you know, I just want to talk a little bit about the, um, the I don't know, Michael, is there anything you wanted to speak to about busing uh, or, or hybrid? I think we've made a lot of adjustments there and, um, and it seems to be functioning pretty well. Is there anything you want to add about that at this time, Michael? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Daly. Um, I, I would agree. I think we, we definitely made some adjustments a little over a week ago um, at the beginning of the, the second um, in-school learning days of each cohort in terms of the, the busing days, uh, our start times uh, um, at some of the, the bus runs. And I've been checking in with the school principals um, almost on a daily basis, and it, it does appear like the schedule, the bus schedule is, is running much more smoothly, and um, the drop-off times are are on time. Um, I haven't seen buses arrive arrive late, um, and the principals have agreed with that. And then even in the afternoon, um, the buses are arriving um, much more quickly, and you know within seven or eight minutes from the clo the close of the school day, particularly at the middle school, which is the last tier, as we know. Um, the, the buses seem to be arriving. So I think, I believe that the adjustments we have made have made have made the, the runs run a lot more smoothly. So great, but thank you. Great, thank you. Um, I think the, the, the big topics now are obviously the extracurriculars and the athletics. Extracurriculars have started, athletics have begun. Um, the, the piece that I wanted to say to the athletics, because I know there's been some discussion around parental participation and spectators, um, you know, the, the first and foremost, our goal was to make sure that the students had a season and they were on the field. We had to make sure that both athletes coming from other districts in our district are comfortable. Um, the Cape Ann League had agreed that we would start the season, make sure that everyone's safe and protected um, by not having any spectators for the first uh, two weeks of competition. We have decided that that date would be on Monday the 12th. Columbus Day would be the day when we would start to have um, the competitions uh, with spectators. And it's my understanding that that number is at 50. Um, we are looking into whether the governor's latest order for phase three, part two um, would change that number. And then we're also aware that the local board of health might weigh in on whether North Reading, given its, you know, uh, its metrics, 
is able to fully move into that phase three part two. But at this time, um, we, you know, I met with the town administrator and Mr. Buckley and Mr. Bracey, the director of public health today, Mr. LaPrette, Mr. Johnson, everyone wants to have um, parents and, and spectators at the games. We want to do this in a safe and careful way. And so we have a proposal um, that we'll be sharing with the, with the others in the league. We would have, um, our plan would be to have two spectators per player that would be allowed to participate. There would be a form that you would sign, a Google form that you could do on your phone or on your computer. Um, you would enter the name of the player and then you would enter your names. We would open the bleachers and we would have designated spaces in the bleachers that are spaced six feet apart with you know X's for the seats and you, you would need to sit in those different seats and spread out throughout the bleachers. Um, and this would allow um, folks to attend. But the reason we're collecting the names, not only to keep our numbers at the 50, because that's the maximum, but it would also help with the contact tracing. So th that is the plan at this time. Um, as far as we are also, just to be clear, we are also exploring options for live streaming. The, the turf field right now does not have a wired internet connection. So that's something that was not a part of the design of the field. Um, and it's something that we are exploring. I have a meeting uh, uh, Wednesday morning. Um, we've, had, we've had a couple of meetings down there with our, with our cable providers to try to get some hardwired connections, which would provide not only the ability to live stream, but the ability to have, um, when our classes are down there, they would have connections to the internet. We would also, you know, town meeting, other events, sporting events, we'd have a Wi-Fi connection down there. And there's some other um, facilities related concerns that the wired connection would help with. So that is something we are, are exploring. In the meantime, we do have photographers and videographers at the game that are recording the games and live streaming through some other uh, methods, uh, but we are looking to have sort of a, a higher level of, of live streaming capabilities. And there have been folks that have gathered at the field on the outside, so I think, you know, if, if, a, if a player needs to have more than two people, there's still, there are other places to gather um, outside of the stands. And this would apply also separately um, for the different fields. So there are different events at different fields, and, and we would have those, those spectator uh, limits at those places as well. Mr. Buckley? So well, I'll open up to the other committee members first for comments. I have some comments afterwards, but my only quick question is, would it be limited to just home fans as part of that proposal? So that's something we, you know, that's something that we're trying to decide. Um, we, we wanted to, to provide it to both uh, sides, but if it is limited at the 50, um, that would allow just about two fans per player from most of the teams. Um, but uh, I'm sorry, for, you know, most teams are about 15 to 20, right? So you're talking about the home team, right? So if you're going to get into the other team, we have to think about what that what that looks like. Um, so obviously, I think a lot of towns, when faced with this, are going to to favor the home parents uh, first. We would like to provide some equal opportunity to parents of seniors, perhaps, on the other team or something like that. So, again, we're trying to get word on whether that number is, is solid at 50. Right now, that's where we're holding at. But we are we are trying to get some clarification on that. I saw, it, I saw something, I was talking to Scott earlier on the news, that if it was outside, that the number increased to 100. Sure. So the governor's, the governor's order for the outside, part Two phase, part three, phase two, right. said for outdoor gatherings or live events, it increased to 100. Right. What's unclear is whether that applies to school and athletic events. It oh. sounds like it does, but when it came out last time, a whole separate order then came out a few days later um, that clarified what this meant for <coughs> sports okay. and what it meant for local sports, youth sports, recreational sports. And, that. and I've inquired at the Department of Education um, and there, there is no guidance yet, and they're not sure if it's coming. We're looking at MIAA, and we're also the town administrator and Mr. Bracey are, are, are looking for this through the Department of Health to see if there's further clarification. And then on top of that, we also need to know whether our Board of Health is going to allow that to expand, or because they're very carefully trying to keep our numbers in the yellow and going the other direction. So anything to increase or to open right now you know, no matter what the governor says, the local boards of health can always uh, be more conservative. So they are still um, asking us to consider that as well. Okay. Thank you. Mr. McGowan, any comments? 
So what sports um, are, are, are we talking about exactly? I assume, well, I, I'll just ask what sports exactly are, are, are playing and, and would be open sure. to fans. Yeah, cross country golf, boys and girls soccer, boys in uh, uh, field hockey, and um, there is football, cheering, and volleyball practices. Right. But I, I believe, Michael, is there a sport I'm forgetting? You're muted. Michael, you're muted. I don't believe so. I, I, think, you, I think you captured all, all of them. And there are some varsity and junior varsity um, teams as well, but those are, I believe those are the sports. Would something like golf, uh, would that be, uh, would, the, would the golf course have to be consulted on all that? The, the venue? Yeah, the venue. Yes, yeah, yeah, we would work with them on that. Their, their, their whole system for fans is a little bit different, as is, I think, cross country is a little bit different as well. Right. You don't really have everyone congregating in one place. It's sort of you've got smaller groups that are at different stations along the way. Mike, Michael knows a lot about cross country uh, right. fans. Is that, is that true, Michael? You don't have everyone in one place, or is it? That's correct, yeah. So they sort of lend itself for a little bit more social distancing for the spectators who have a little bit more freedom to kind of spread out uh, during the venue. So, um, but, but typically, you know, they would be certainly the, the course in the terms of golf. I think they would put out some of their requirements for spectators and designated locations that are acceptable that the course lends itself to. And it's, it's similar to, to cross country, whether it's a home meet or an away meet, I think the, the hosting team would, would provide some guidelines that are acceptable areas for, spectators to kind of social distance and spread out and still see, you know, areas at the starting line and finish line and so forth. Yeah. So I guess, I guess I'm totally open to this and, and I know that the, you know, the, the people in North Reading have, have been great about, you know, in general about social distancing and I'm certainly supportive of our efforts in the school. I'm just concerned about there's certain situations where something might not be entirely in our control um, uh, where you know, extra people show up or, or, or don't really understand the, the rules. Um, so I guess I would just say, you know, we should be thinking in the, along those terms and making sure that, you know, we have a way of controlling in those sort of uh, away from the field uh, situations. Yeah, that's a great point. I, Mr. Johnson will, will surely follow up with the venues as will the coaches um, and, and to make sure that those, uh, those messages are communicated. Um, I think the, the, the numbers of the typical crowds at those events as well is probably sure. well under the 50. So I think that's helpful as well. Yep. Uh, so, but I think it's uh, it's a great point and we'll follow up, so. Great. Okay, Mr. Papa Vasilio. Um, yeah, kind of on the heels, <clears throat> excuse me, of Rich's point, um, how would we go about uh, monitoring or enforcing uh, appropriate uh, social distancing uh, amongst the fans? Taser, sure, yeah. Yes, School committee volunteers. Now we, yeah. um, you know, Mr. Johnson is at, at all the varsity games, or he, there's a designee that's there. There are administrators that are present, um, and folks will be keeping an eye on it. We might have some some volunteers to help us as well. But there's going to be like so many other things, uh, you know, a trust and an honor system as well. When people put their names into the form with the contact tracing, they're also agreeing to. Um, to sit socially distanced, to wear masks, and to be, um, you know, to, to follow and maintain all rules. We've actually uh, purchased some additional signage for all of our, our fields and, and spaces that reinforce all these behaviors. And, you know, I think everyone knows that, like I started by saying, the most important thing is that our students have games and competitions that they're able to play. And I think anyone that would do anything to jeopardize that by not following the rules it's only going to hurt the students. And that's why we're all here. That's why we're all here to cheer them on at the games. And the last thing we would want is, is that. You know, I think it's important to clarify that part of what I did when I reached out to other superintendents on the question of, um, you know, if we are in the red, are we still able to play? Because it was originally proposed that if a town went into the red, those games had to be canceled or postponed. And I think everyone, all the superintendents are in agreement that it's not necessarily means that those games don't play, but there are some schools that may want to postpone those games. Um, so we need to, as a community, do everything possible to, to keep those numbers down, 
to keep the kids healthy. And I, I can I can understand that. I can understand why sending kids into a, a situation um, where the, where the the numbers are, are the cases are high is is a risk that that the school is taking. And so I could understand why they would need to postpone or possibly cancel a game. But we want to try to avoid that. So everything we can do to keep our numbers uh, trending in the back in the right direction um, is going to be very important. Chris, any other comments? No, I'm good. Thank you. And and for my comments, I'll just say I appreciate you know the clarity on this. Um, I think I think everybody has to understand we have to start with the guidelines. So whatever the governor says, if the governor says 50 or 100, you know we can't go above that. The local board of health as well. And some of this might change. If we go into the red, there might be a change to some of these plans. Um, we have to make sure that we have to also understand that in the Cape Ann League. There's a lot of schools that are not open right now that are that are full remote right now and so we you know i think it there was a lot of planning that was needed amongst the different schools i think that's a lot of what went into the first two week uh, moratorium but i do firmly believe that if we're open like we're outside and i think people can be six feet apart i think people are responsible i think you know parents should be able to see their kids play there's also a you know there also should be some conformity to other sports leagues I mean, I watched my son play soccer last weekend at, you know, when I was six feet apart, only one of us was allowed to go there. I know some people are playing flag football in the same field that we're playing soccer on. And so, you know, there should be some consistency with that. And again, it's a different organization. And so, you know, we have to follow all the guidelines, but I think this is a good plan for the proposal. And I think I encourage the school to talk to the other communities and once the two week uh, period ends, I would love to be able to see a limited number of fans at the field to cheer on their their kids. Yep. So, so as of right now, that is our plan. We're moving forward with the the tool that will be shared out. This will be a tool that will uh, at this moment we think it's going to be filled out before every game. We just uh, my thought was that you know instead of filling it out in advance for all the games you're going to go to, and then you forget whether you filled it out or not, or you know I, I think it makes the most sense to do it as you're going to the game, um, and then you'll have that information and we'll have that information um, about who's attending so okay any other comments i know there's some parents that have reached out to me any other comments or questions Just feel free to type in your name if you would like to talk or a question if you'd like okay i would also just um yeah go ahead okay. done. hi this is barbara thorstad thank you to the committee for your time tonight um, my daughter is a on the um, girls varsity soccer team. Um, it is listed on mass.gov that MIAA bumped it up to 100 people for outdoors. Um, one thing I think is in our favor um, is that we have a large bleachers similar to Newburyport. I don't think all the Cape Ann League is gonna be able to accommodate the same amount of fans safely. Um, so I, I don't know the capacity for our bleachers, but that's certainly working in our favor. The other great thing that works in our favor is once the bleachers have reached the capacity of whatever um, the Board of Health and others have decided is, is the right number for us, let's say at 60, and there's overflow, luckily they can go to the fence on 62, which is pretty awesome. Um, and um, I won't bore you with it now, but um, I do have some ideas about the Google Docs scenario, especially with the person who has to work late and doesn't come, and then he sends somebody else who doesn't fill out contact tracing. So anyway, if you haven't already thought of that, um, that's something we can get to, um, get to at a later point. Um, I wanted to touch on something that happened this week, and that is, um, uh, it was uh, great that at the boys varsity first home soccer game, they were able to um, uh, right on the fly, they um, were able to ask and get permission to have one photographer and one videographer um, in, um, in the bleacher area. And um, when I heard about that, I called Dave Johnson today to say, hey, I heard about the great news for the boys soccer team. Can the girls soccer team do that? And um, he said yes. And um, then I also asked him if for the away game on Wednesday, he would be willing to um, call the athletic director of Triton and ask if the girls soccer team could have one photographer and one videographer in their bleacher or sideline area. And again, he said yes. He said yes with the understanding that this doesn't mean it's approval. It just means that he's okay with it. And he would make the phone call. 
And also we all understand that on the other side, the, um, the other um, school is certainly their prerogative to say, no, we're not able to accommodate that. And, and that's perfectly fair and fine. What I wanna get at today is what do we need to do to green light that this would be the scenario, not just for boys soccer and girls soccer, because we heard about it, but for each of the fall sports that field hockey, boys soccer, girls soccer can get the green light to have one photographer and one videographer in the stands. And that for each of their away games that at least the inquiry is made from Dave uh, Johnson to the athletic director of the opposing school to say, um, you know, can we can we do this? Is it safe today or tomorrow, whatever the case may be? And then we would just honor with, you know, no questions asked, whatever they want, and we would do that. Um, but right now, it's ha it's happening on a just you know informal who heard about it first basis, and it seems like it's something that we would like to make fair and consistent across the fall sports. Sure. So I, I believe I, I addressed this earlier. That, that is something that's happening at all the games um, for all the sports. That might have developed today, but that's what Mr. Johnson said uh, well, to me. I don't know what time you talked to him, but it's it's certainly not happening for girls soccer. Yeah, he 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 has he's he's he gave me information to share tonight. So that that's the the message now is that this is. Um, he, I'll read it to you. It's, he says, we are allowing two parents from each school to take pictures and film the games, both home and away for the Cal League this fall. Com communication for this is from ADVAD for each team. So, so it, it, that's, that's, does that that's for all, I'm reading that as for all teams, for all sports, both home and away. Oh, so, well, that's, so that, 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 that's as of about 1245 today. Okay. So that's, that's, that's what I shared um, earlier tonight. And that sounds like a positive step from, maybe where we were. So okay. I think maybe your advocacy helped to get that. And, I, you know, I can certainly confirm and follow that up with him, but I'm reading that as um, it, it, yeah, it's greenlit for everything. Hopes, that's what he hoped to have happen. But again, yeah. you know, at the time it was him and I talking on the phone, we could have proved any number of things. Um, so glad to hear that it's um, it got rolled up and that is official. Um, yeah. So okay. Mrs. Mrs. Thor said, the one thing that I would add too, I know from speaking with NORCAM before, they want to have content, and there are sometimes some um, some reg reg regulations that they deal with 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 uh, different sports leagues. But if you communicate, if, if you're going to be taking video, if you communicate with NORCAM, they might let you borrow some of their better cameras, and they might actually post it on Nor on NORCAM as well. They're looking for content. They're looking for that, and so I think one of the biggest challenges they often have is that they do not have people to actually, you know, take the time to go out and, and, and tape that. So if you are interested in being somebody that tapes, if you communicate with NORCAM, it might be something that they could put on their, uh, the, on the local cable station as well. And they might allow you to use a, you know, a nice camera in order to tape the film. Okay. We, we also wanted to see about the students who are either in AV class or an AV club if there are students that um, who are probably pretty slick with an iPad and whatnot, um, that they would be, um, does, does anybody know, are there any teachers or clubs that are um, uh, focused in that area? I can speak to Mr. Lopret about that again. That's, that's a question we have sort of every year and there's, that's not often that they're available in the same way. Um, there is a club, sometimes it runs, sometimes it doesn't. I'm not sure the status right now, but that is every year we want to try to get more students uh, <coughs> recording games and getting involved. I, in schools I worked in in the past, that was uh, very much the norm, that students sort of did their broadcast, and we, we would love to see that. We worked with NORCAM in the past on this, so it's something we're, we're building toward. Uh, what happens in North Reading, I, I, you know, part of what I see is that the students that are in the AV program are also in the theater program. They're also the athletes. They're all, they're doing three or four things, and uh -huh. there's not always a, a group of students that that is available to cover um, the games. But that's definitely a goal that we have, and we can certainly okay. check in with Mr. Lapred on the updates there. Okay. Um, and then just to also let you know, there's no shortage of parents who are willing and ready to help behind the scenes with spreadsheets and contact tracing or before the games with placing markers on bleachers or paying for markers or whatever, whatever you 
so um, feel free to reach out. I know there's a representative from at least each of the fall sports on the phone with us tonight. Um, and um, we, um, you know, we're, we're ready to go. No, that's fantastic. So again, I, I appreciate what you're sharing with the, the MIAA. That's something that we'll continue to discuss. Um, you know, I was asked today to consider, you know, that we, that we go with what's already in place while the Board of Health kind of considers um, whether, whether we're going to be able to move to that level or whether we need to stay where we are. But that, that, that's an ongoing discussion that we're still looking for more information. So right now we're still safe to go with the 50 and then we need to see whether we can move up to that next, that next level. But there will be a change um, for, for Monday the 12th. So. Right. That's a nice. Um, and there are some games on Monday the 12th. That's what you mean, literally Monday the 12th. Um, yes. That, open. That's the, that's the plan. That would be day one of this uh, yeah. scenario. Yep. That, that's a nice uh, holiday present. So thank you. Yep. <laughs> All right. Any other comments? I see Mrs. Lavier. La, I can't say it. Laverdier. Laverdier, yeah. But thank you. <laughs> um okay so it sounds it sounds like the only the only thing i would comment on this is rich um uh, is um um that piece about uh the communication with the aid with the uh, opposing school ad that feels like it's a game by game situation not a blanket thing right that 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 um uh, mr johnson is going to be communicating with uh, other ad's sort of yeah. on, on an ongoing basis not that everyone's agreed that it's okay is that is that how i'm reading that yeah, I, I, I can check that. I'm not reading it that way. I'm reading it that the, the communication of who the people are that would kind of, um, oh, okay. some, they, they would they would be sort of above and beyond the the parental form. Okay. Um, would, would be, he would communicate that there's going to be a videographer and a photographer. Here are the two names and they get to come in sort of like a press pass as opposed okay. to this typical, that's how I'm understanding it based on the the conversation I had with him prior to this email, but I will I will verify all of that and we'll have all that in, in place. And we will certainly have you know a, a process for people to uh, to let us know if they if they're not coming or they're going to change. You know, there's no perfect system with the contact tracing, but we certainly feel that having that cap and having that limit and having those um, you know those pieces in place will certainly be better than just a free for all. So um, so, but I appreciate the feedback on the form as well. I have a question. Um, can you guys hear me? Well, go ahead, Mr. Tremontosi. Yeah, this is all the Tremontosi. So I just had a question, point of clarification. Um, so the the prohibition on spectators, um, just from my understanding, it was that enacted to protect the players or the play or, or the parents? So to protect the players. That's what the the Cape Ann League when they came together to decide whether they were going to have a league or whether they were going to play, whether they're going to participate, what it was going to look like. Um, what was decided was that we would start sort of a two week soft opening students and, and players only. Um, and, and all of the Cape Ann league, uh, districts agreed that that would be the start because there were some districts that, as you look around the, the state, there are some schools that just aren't playing or, uh, they, they postpone their season. Um, this league based on our numbers, you know, like, like Mr. Buckley said, a lot of those schools are not open right now and those schools aren't in session because they felt that the, they weren't ready to return, but they wanted to have athletics, but they wanted to do it just for the students first and get the students out there. And then after two weeks, we'd revisit um, whether spectators would come. So there, there may be other uh, districts in the, in the league that are not opening to spectators. That doesn't, I, I, I want to make sure that's clear too. Just because North Reading's doing this on the 12th, that doesn't mean that every single uh, district is doing that. They're going to make their own decisions in their in their um, in their communities. Right. I understand. I guess from the point of you know from the perspective of a parent, I, with a lot of this venues that we have, where you know, you know one exception comes immediately to mind, Rockport, um, but most of the Cal teams. Uh, have more modern stadium, if you will, right? Tracks and bleachers, um, and there's a buffer there. So I'm just curious, no matter what the numbers were, why, you know, that would be considered um, a risk to the players when there's such a physical distance between the, it's, it's, it's almost like two different venues, if you will, right? I, I don't want to have an argument, but it, I just, it just some of the, some of the things that apparently don't seem to make a lot of sense. You know what I mean? It, it's that's why the, the question I pre prefaced it with if you're protecting the players there's 
mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're as distant from the players as you can possibly be, basically. Um, you know what I mean? So, you know, hopefully that's that's taken into consideration when we meet, as opposed to when, when, you know, when there is that opportunity on the 12th or whatever that might be, to look at it, you know, more or less logically and say, how are these, pay, how are these players impacted um, by people being a good 20, 30, 40, 50 yards away, right? Regardless of the numbers. Um, yeah. And so thank yeah, you for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Sure, and that's something that every that every school district, athletic director, principal, superintendent, local board of health, they have to make all those considerations along with the venues that they're in. So, um, logic certainly a part of it, but there there are many other factors that that are unique to those communities. So we you know we we can make the decisions here. We made a decision as a as a league to look at this you know to and to, to come up with one decision for two weeks to make sure it it happened and every you know um, we just wanted to make sure the kids got out there and played. We've had success with that, and now we're going into the second phase, which is allowing spectators back. So again, we, we'll be able to move forward with that North Reading um, for now. You know, and, and again, if things if things change here, if the numbers get to a certain place, and the Board of Health weighs in, we might have to revisit that as well. But right now, things are in such a place that we feel it's safe to do this, and we're going to move forward with it. Yeah, and 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 remember that, like I'm I'm, I'm on school committee boards as well, and. There's a lot of districts around here that didn't open to begin and they're just starting to transition. So I, I suspect some of them wanted to get their kids back in school, you know, in the first couple of weeks before they started dealing with athletic issues. Yep. Um, the question came in about what, how, how do they figure, how do we figure out if you can go to another town? Is there going to be any communication about that for? There, I imagine that's going to come out through the, um, through the coaches about, about what that looks like. And, you know, I think, my understanding is parents have been going to games. Um, it's just a matter of whether they're actually getting into the, you know, in, in, into the fields or closer. They've been sitting in cars and watching or at a fence or whatnot. So obviously I don't think anything's going the other direction that I've heard. Um, but as to what their process is, you know, I, I told Mr. Johnson to share out what we're doing because if, if they want to have something as simple as a Google form, I think that's a good idea for other districts to, to adopt and, and go with anyway, but they may have their own system. Um, and, and that will be, you know, shared out. So we're going to continue to talk to those schools and those districts. But like I said, a lot of those districts are dealing with many other things beyond, um, beyond sports right now. And uh, and so we're not we might not get answers everywhere, but as we get them, um, that that will be communicated out. So, okay. Thank you very much. Any other topics I, for I, school reopening? I believe those uh, those are the main uh, pieces of school reopening that I wanted to cover tonight. I just want to make sure. I think the other piece I'm going to speak about during the academic calendar part. So. My, my only question is, are how what percentage of people are doing the daily screening? What percentage of I people? Mean, do, do, is, there, is there a lot of participation in it? it? I mean, it's it's very, very highly okay. done. The only thing I say to remind, I'll just say, you know, I always say to do it the morning of, not the night before. We want to see those those results. But we are getting, um, you know, you know that it's the most uh, activity I've seen in a spreadsheet around here in a long time. We usually we do a lot of surveys, but we've got twenty twenty thousand um, you know pieces of data that I was just deleting tonight and moving over so that we could navigate it a little bit better. So people are doing a great job with that. It's a great heads up for us to uh, to, to to have conversations, um, and our nurses are using that every day. So it's very been very very helpful. So thank you for please continue doing it. It's very helpful to us. Um, to uh, to make the best decisions for our kids. Well, I apologize to Buckley Stone. We forgot a couple of times yeah. last week, but and that may happen. It, you know, it's it's not a catch-all system. It's not a perfect <laughs> system, but it's certainly given us a heads up on uh, on conversations that we need to have to make sure everyone. And and has there been any uptick in the lunches? Uh, that's maybe a budget item, but Mr. Connolly. Um, thank you, Mr. Buckley. So the, the lunches have increased over the last week or so. So, um, so those are definitely on a, on a moderate, um, increase right now. And we'll just be certainly, um, monitoring that. And it's, you know, part of this will be included in my budget update a little bit later on in the meeting. Um, but I think, I think the participation of, of in school lunches are showing signs that they're on the rise. And we would love to um, continue to increase the 
the grab and go program for the remote learning days. Again, that's it's available. It's there. It's 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 a free breakfast and a lunch every day for all all students. And um, we would love to have families just try to take take a part in that program as well. Right. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, move on to new business. We have the academic calendar to discuss and a couple of changes here. Sure. So just just a couple of. Um, of things that, that we wanted to discuss here. I, I had mentioned last time that we had moved the October 9th Professional Development Day off the schedule. Um, what we have decided, so one opportunity that uh, we're going to be able to offer students is to, to allow them to take the SAT on October 14th. Right now, there are not a lot of opportunities for students to take the SAT. A lot of the traditional centers are closed. <clears throat> Um, there's a one-day opportunity for students to take the SAT at school. It has to be on the 14th. Since it's a Wednesday, that's already a release day for elementary. And our thought is to bring that uh, professional development day that we didn't have on the 9th and move it to the 14th. Um, that would be just for middle school and high school, but it's for everybody that day. Okay, So mm -hmm. we would be technically banking an elementary half day somewhere that we would make up you know, for equity. But as far as um, communication goes, it's just now everyone has a half day on that day. What that allows is the students to be spaced out in the cafeterias, the gymnasium, a lot of those large areas. Um, we have to subdivide the spaces. I believe it's like 25 or less in those areas to keep it. But it allows all of our interested seniors to take the exam. Um, we would be able to have the proctors and all of the uh, the support that's needed for students for accommodations provided from our staff and then the staff that are um, here would, would have professional development. So in addition to that, I also removed, there was one redundant item on the schedule. We, we don't have a PM kindergarten this year. Our half day is all in the morning. And so there was an AM PM switch that's always in there that I just took that out because it was redundant. So I believe those are the, the updates to the calendar um, that we would that we would just approve tonight. So the, the I, I would like to just start by saying I've, I've seen a few things on Facebook about the limitations of finding spaces for SAT. Yep. So I applaud the district um, yep. making that change to allow that because I know that's something that a lot of parents are are having a lot of concerns over. And I ask, and I know I know a lot of people, I, I assume that's only for North Reading students. And But I also want to just ask if there's any chance that we would do another one because I know some parents I don't know if they get the results and then they can take it again, but that would be something that we, again, if, if we're ha if we're seeing a need for that, then I wonder if we should consider even a potentially a sure. second day if there is another day in the future. So I want to thank Ms. LaPrette yeah. and Ms. La, uh, Mr. Rosa, um, who did an outstanding job researching this and really figuring out all of the fine details of it um, and really coming to me advocating for why this would be great for kids. Um, the... There, there's also the PSAT. There's the, you know so the, there's other things on their mind for this, but it's, a, it's all of those are a little bit different. And, and my understanding is this is the only opportunity that we have right now. And if there is something later and there is a desire, I'm sure that they will advocate for it as well. Um, but right now, this is the the opportunity to do this this year. Um, this would be the last. This would generally be the around the last time a senior would take it anyway, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. So. You know, and that's what, and I, I, if I didn't say it, uh, I will say this, this is for seniors only. Yeah, so this is, did, this is it, what yeah. we're doing here at this point. Yep. So, um, yeah, so we would continue to think about that if need be, but, um, but I would say that. And just in general about the calendar, you know, we have those TBDs in there. And the reason we did those to be determined dates was, we, you know, while everything is going great right now, we're very optimistic that we're going to remain in, in our, in our hybrid in-person um, model. We don't know what, what the future looks like. And similar to the spring, we weren't sure how to use April vacation, how to use half days. We wanted to do that based on uh, the situation we're in. So the feedback I have received from many parents is that they're happy. They do see a difference with what the hybrid and remote learning looks like this year. Um, and certainly, you know, I, I think, and even our, I met with our NREA president, he notices a difference even with elementary. Elementary is really um, doing a lot of things, going above and beyond. It's, it's just different with the younger kids. And we may need to build in some breaks at different times just to give them time to, to figure some things out and to, and to um, you know, so as I said, banking a day here or there, maybe making use of that to give them some time to, to, uh, to do their planning. 
We are also, I, I forgot to mention earlier, um, I believe um, that this is coming from one of the grants that just got approved. I, I know it's coming from the grant. I think the grant just got approved. Uh, but we're going to hire some additional remote learning assistants for the elementary schools, some additional support staff, because just having other adults there just to support the teachers when they're doing both live teaching and teaching at home, especially at that level, it's really important. So I, I think in general, just about the calendar, just to keep those things in mind, that there may be some things added as needed, because we've never done this before. You know, our calendar is built on what we know and when breaks are needed and when things happen. Um, so we're going to uh, possibly need to talk about some other some other breaks. We're right now going for the 14th, and then we do have a full day on uh, November 3rd. So, so I did put in for a vote just to approve those changes. And uh, can I have a motion? Can I have a motion to approve the uh, revised academic calendar for 2020 through 2021? So moved. Second. I'll second. Okay. So Janine and Rich. We'll do a roll call vote. Janine? Aye. Rich? Aye. Chris? Aye. I'm an aye as well. Passes 4-0. Thank you very much. Uh, now the school committee calendar. Sure. So this, <clears throat> this item, I, I'm not sure um, whether there's going to be a change. It's, it's a slight update to some of the dates here. We were going to propose uh, canceling our next meeting on October 19th. But um, I do think that we should update this, keep that date um, based on some uh, the need to discuss some of the ongoing changes that are going on in the school and with our, um, our community. We may move some of the items that are on November 5th to that uh, meeting so what we can discuss that moving forward. So I, I originally was going to propose a cancellation of a meeting, but I'm, a, I'm actually going to say that we should probably just keep our calendar as is for the time being. Okay. And the, the only question I had on this also was, we had a uh, discussion, I believe, after the last meeting about um, yeah. the location, about not having them at the schools. Yep. Is that still the plan? That we we'll probably will not meet at, at the Hood Batch and Little? Correct. I think I think we will update it to reflect. You know, I didn't reflect that here, so I can do that for our next meeting. I think we would still have a Hood School presentation, but the Correct. location would be virtual. So they okay. would uh, they would be broadcasting to us. Um, but not, we would not be going to the schools this year. So if we're not canceling the meeting, why don't we just pass over this item? Yep. And we'll move to the Batchelder principal search timeline. Excellent, so thank you so much. So as everyone's aware, uh, Mr. Clean has been um, appointed to the position of assistant superintendent. He's scheduled to begin on December 1st. Um, after <coughs> a lot of consideration, my recommendation um, is that I will begin with a, a detailed process of having focus groups with the staff and the students at the Batchelder School, but with the recommendation that we have an interim position from December 1st through June 30th. And we would post that position. Um, I would be equally open to having a, an internal candidate. I'm aware of some very talented uh, internal candidates that would be vying for this position. I think it would be a good idea for to give those folks a chance to interview and, and to meet with some of the folks at the school who would be part of an interview committee. Um, but I would also, depending on the scenario and the situation, whether we're in full in-person, hybrid, remote, all those different things could be possible as we get to December. I would entertain a retired principal who may want to come in for, for some time. Um, I would also entertain um, some other creative solutions with, with Mr. Colleen and, and the assistant superintendent position, all depending on where we are. But if, if everything was like it is today, I would want to have a, a certainly a, an interim principal in that position. Um, that allows us though, because as I mentioned earlier, there are schools right now that don't have, they're not in school, they're in virtual. I think for us to conduct site visits and to do all those things right now is, is not the best timing. And it's difficult, similar to what I spoke about this time last year about replacing myself, the best pool of candidates you're going to find ready to move and transition on July 1 as opposed to on December 1st. So, um, you know, I, I do think we've got some great internal folks, but I think, you know, this is, this is an important uh, position. It's our first principal search, I believe, since, I want to say 2012, um, or, or may, maybe a little bit later when, when Mrs. Um, O'Connell came on. I think she was our last principal we brought in. So I think it's, it's very important. Oh, Mr. LaPrette. Yeah, LaPrette. Mr. LaPrette, I think, I think Mr. LaPrette was. Mr. Bernard. 
Yeah. Okay. You're right. That was yeah. in fourteen or fifteen. I forget ex exactly. Yep. No, you're right. You're right. Yeah. But he was here. But you're right. But it wasn't. But a yeah, it, it was a search. Yeah. Exactly. So, but either way, it's been it's been about six years then um, since that's happened. So, um, so the point is that you know, and I, I do want to make it clear that with any of the interim folks who apply, sometimes you are not allowed to then go for the full. I would say this absolutely. If the person does well they would be able to apply and would re-interview. It would not just be a, an appointment. It would be a, a, we would still go through the process in the spring. For the committee, I'm proposing that, you know, I certainly would be a part of this uh, to, to name the principal, um, a central office team member. So that could be uh, Michael or Cynthia. Um, um, Sean Colleen obviously will be involved as well as the current principal. We would have another principal, um, the president of the CPAC, a parent, at least two teachers, the school nurse or psychologist as well, someone from the, uh, the staff at the, at the bachelor school, a paraprofessional from the bachelor school, um, the administrative assistant, obviously, who works very closely with the principal. And I, I would say a school committee member. We've had school committee members in the past on the search committee. So, um, and that group would meet um, both for the interim piece um, and it would be the same group for the other. And then it would be the same group in the spring, right? And then we'd see, you know, it's it certainly, it, it will be a definitely a, a, a very involved process for the full search. We'll see what we get for candidates with the with the internals and, and, and what that looks like. But I think that um, would be the process here. And I wanted to outline that now so that we could think ahead to, to get these posted in the next few weeks and get a, a pool of candidates for, for that to start the first transition. So if, if, if I may, I think there's, three different topics here. One is the interim, making sure that we're all in favor of that. The second is the timeline, and the third would be the appointment from the school committee. I, I was thinking we would have to try to appoint somebody tonight if we were gonna have a meeting on October 19th, but if we are, I would suggest that we delay that because Diana Boutwell is a parent at the Batchelder. Yep. So I was gonna, I would at least want her to be part of the discussion because sure. if she wants to throw her hat into that ring. Yep. So Absolutely. I would propose that we don't appoint the school committee member to that committee tonight. Sure. Um, but so before we talk about the timeline, I just want to make sure does the committee is the committee all in favor of Dr. Daly's proposal to do an interim for the rest of this year and then later try to hire for the next school year? Mrs. Hi, Imbriano? Yes. Okay. Mr. McGowan? Yes, and also I'm you know, perfectly happy if, if the decision is to just, just look at internal uh, candidates. Uh, I don't have a problem with that as well. Mr. Uh, Papavasilio? Yeah, I agree. Sounds like a good plan. Yeah, and I do too. So I, I think that's, that's yeah. fine there. And then questions on the timeline. The one, one thing that I was going to suggest here was, well, two things on the committee. Number one, for the parent, I would clarify, I think it should be a batch parent. Absolutely. Just, to, just yep. to make sure, because it, it just didn't list it there, and so I think sure. that should yep. for sure be a yep. batch parent. Yep. And would the chair of the committee be you or somebody different? It would, would there be. be. Would be you, okay. Yep. And I guess my only other question would be, are we going to look for possibly hiring a recruiting firm to get different applicants, or are we not going to? Or are we just going to post ourselves and just see what we what we get? So we would, you know, I'm going to speak with the with the um, committee, the the parents and the staff of the school to see and to see what um, what would be needed. I think there are definitely different avenues that we can explore to to post. I mean, we could definitely go beyond just the school spring typical um, posting that we do. Um, I, I don't typically we don't go with the firms and spend you know a lot of money, but I think maybe. Um, getting the, the word out in a lot of different areas and across the state, I think might be a, a good idea as well. Okay. Do other people have questions or thoughts on the timeline or the process? Ms. McGowan? Nope, I'm good. Thanks. Janine? No, I'm not. Chris? Uh, oh, there you go. Nope, I'm good. Okay. So do you, you, did, you just had a discussion on this. Do you want to vote on the timeline or not? I don't know that you need. No, we don't need to vote. Okay. Yeah, this is just. Okay. You know, technically, this is uh, my my hire as <laughs> superintendent. Sure. I'm just sharing the process with you, so it's not just confirming quite as much of a approval as some of the other hires. But um, I what, just what wanted to make sure vote? everyone yeah. was on board. Yeah. <laughs> yep. I think I think we all agree with that. Then. Excellent. Okay. Moving on to school committee goals. 
Did we not vote this before or not? No, you actually yeah. never sent it out. Yeah, this this is the first time we've okay. sort of officially yeah. kind of looked at all. Okay. So at this time, what we're hoping to do is to look through all of our goals for the year. Um, I just want to talk through some of the, the, the updates and changes that we've made. And there may be some revisions. This this is sort of a draft, but if we are comfortable, we could we could blow that through. So, um, so part of what we discussed during our, our workshop uh, early this summer was to uh, to streamline and to try to focus a lot of our goals. Um, overall, it's gone down to it's a two page document as opposed to a four page document. Uh, but I think that all of the goals and objectives and actions are. Um, they're very, they're very active, right? They're not passive statements. They are, they all are, you know, from what I can see, they're fairly measurable. And so I'll just share the, the document that we, that we drew together. We took the goal statements and the objectives and combined those um, in, into, into different areas. One thing that, that changed through the process, we changed the word activities to actions, uh, just thinking that that was a little bit more of, a, of, a, of an active uh, step. And so it's still the goals are arranged under leadership and governance, final financial and asset management, educational program, and family and community relations. So I don't know whether, did you want to look at them in any detail or did you just want to point out any comments or questions that we have? I don't have any specific need to do that. I don't know if anybody else does. I mean, the public might think we're going from four pages to two, so we're doing less and they're correct. We're going to be doing a lot less this year. <laughs> Kidding, hopefully. Um, Mrs. Imbriano, did you see anything and anything that was contrary to what we talked about at our workshop? Well, unfortunately, I didn't. Um, oh. I would have to put them down I, okay. again, and I had yeah. not done that, but um, <coughs> I'm assuming that this is what was on the screen yeah. type thing. Is that you didn't, you know. <laughs> put anything else in there. So I, I don't have any, I, I was in agreement with what <coughs> transpired when we were going through it to begin with. So, no. Mr. McGowan, did you see anything? No, these look, uh, these look good to me. And uh, Mr. Papa Vasilio? No, nope, looks good. Okay. Me too. I don't think we have to go through it all. I mean, we had a couple of meetings on it, so. So can we can I have a motion to approve the North Riding School Committee goals for 2020-2021? So moved. I'll second. Okay. Do a roll call vote. There's no discussion. Uh, Janine? Aye. Rich? Aye. Chris? Aye. I'm an aye as well. Passes 4-0. Thank you, everyone. I think these are our solid goals, and I think we will share these out. Our plan is to work with our NRPS 2025 goals, school improvement goals, administrator goals, and teacher goals, and all have some alignment. I think there's some great places here for our teachers to, to build on some of these goals as well. And so that'll be that'll be great for that kind of vertical alignment there. So that's great. That's great. Okay. Moving on to the minutes, Mrs. Imbriano. Would you like to I will do the honors. I make a motion to accept the open session minutes of September 24th as written. I'll second. Okay. Any discussion? Anybody notice anything off? Aye. Looks spot on. Okay. Uh, roll call vote. Janine? Aye. Rich? Aye. Chris? Aye. I'm an aye as well. 4-0. Thank you very much. <coughs> Budget update, Mr. Connolly? <laughs> great. Yeah, I'm right. I'm right here. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. Just trying to trying to find the mute unmute button. Um so yeah, so our first budget update for fiscal twenty one essentially reflects activity through the first quarter of the fiscal year, um, through the through the month of September. Um I, I believe though as we as we know, it's certainly everything's a little bit more involved and a little more more complicated because we're dealing with a lot of unforeseen costs and several expenses that um, arose during the summer months to address supply and equipment needs related to the reopening of schools and with the, with the pandemic and the COVID-19 virus. Uh, we had to certainly had to ensure that we had the proper equipment um, in many of these expenses, certainly the protective personal equipment 
cleaning and sanitation supplies, um, computer devices, the various HVAC upgrades that occurred at all five schools. Um, we, we anticipate that we are in the process of um, transferring just about all these expenses to federal grants that we have received, in, including a reopening grant and the Technologies Essentials grant and another CARES Act grant that we uh, were able to receive and, and secure um, during the sort of the late summer months at the, in, into the beginning of September. Uh, there's certainly additional supplies and e equipment and, and, and classroom materials, and in some cases, um, educational software that are all related to the, the reopening of schools and, and certainly can be related to the COVID-19 virus that we have charged to the general fund. Um, these are reflected on the bottom of the report, so you can certainly identify um, what some of these expenses are. We are continuing to work pretty closely with the town finance office um, to pursue the reimbursement of these expenses from the CARES Act funding that has been made available to all municipalities um, beginning at the emergency school closure, which began last March and um, will continue at least right now through the month of December. Uh, although we anticipate, uh, we are hopeful, although nothing has been released yet, that that, that it, deadline could be extended um, you know, much further than December of, of 2020. Um, so certainly in this report, uh, we also included an additional summary of the available funding in the, in the grants that are specifically for the school department that are related to the COVID-19 virus. Um, not all of these expenses yet that we have identified in these federal grants have been transferred mm -hmm from the general fund to these available grant sources, which I think is the reason if you're seeing deficits in certain areas, which I can, I'll address in a moment, um, it's certainly related to the fact that we are, uh, we're waiting for the, these grants to be officially approved and then we would uh, officially move, move some of the funding over to the federal grants. Um, but in some of the more typical process that we go through in the summer, the supplies necessary to start the school year, and each school certainly has been ordered in process. Uh, we've encumbered all utility expenses and we're certainly monitoring utilities and, and so forth as we as we move through through the first quarter of the year. We will continue to do that. Um, you know, the revolving count balances, I think if there's any area of, of uncertainty or the big, largest area of uncertainty is certainly around the, uh, some of our revolving accounts, those, those funding, uh, accounts that we take in either a user fee or, or a tuition um, to help offset certain expenses. Certainly the athletic revolving fund, food service revolving fund, transportation, and then the tuition-based programs for the kindergarten pre-K accounts. Um, you know, th there's a level of uncertainty there. I don't think there's any area of immediate concern, um, but there's certainly going to be a, a need to closely monitor um, these accounts, giving some of the, certainly the revenue um, and these accounts based on participation in some areas are is, is down from what we expected when we budgeted last last December. But I will say, I think we were we anticipated a lot of this and we were able to do some things at the end of fiscal year 20 when we closed out the fiscal year to kind of hedge the fact that we we knew there was uncertainty in these revolving accounts and that they were participation or revenue and so and so forth. Um, was in some ways unknown or uncertain. So I think we did set ourselves up pretty well with a very strong closeout of fiscal year 20 um, to kind of hedge any, any, any level of risk there to, to put ourselves in the ability to, to, to deal with some of the, that uncertainty. But it certainly is an area of, that we've spoken of in the past and that we'll have to certainly watch. Um, but we continue to pursue all areas of, of federal funding and grants that could be available Due to the COVID-19 virus, um, we did apply for a, a food service emergency feeding grant. I, um, that was one grant we have not been notified yet or have not received. Um, we'll continue to try to um, get updates on that. Um, but the, the other grants that are identified on the supplemental report um, have been officially secured at this point. And I'll speak to some of those in, in a moment. But on the, on the payroll side, you know, just as a typical business in the summer and, and, you know, we were certainly busy filling 
staff vacancies. Um, we, we certainly had a need to hire some long-term substitutes to fill some extended leave of absences this school year. Um, we don't anticipate any of any of these, this will have a significant impact on the substitute budget. Um, we did hire building substitutes at each building um, at this time as we spoke to, and, and some of that cost was certainly part of our, our federal grants that we, um, uh, expenses that we identify in some of these federal grants given that cost, it was a, a new cost this year. Um, we've had the need to hire some additional instructional you know, learning aids to assist in each building, um, especially in the kindergarten program. Um, we've had, we've hired some additional staffing, including a, some additional custodial staff to help you know, meet the needs across all five schools and, and campuses to address the touch point cleaning and, and disinfecting and sanitation that is, is, that is occurring. Uh, we've, we've hired an additional technician to help um, given the, the influx of new devices, the need for technology assistance. So we, we've done that. And we, I think as everyone's aware, we've hired a district-wide Florida nurse. So all of those kind of new positions certainly can be all be related to the COVID-19 virus. And all these positions are part of federal grants that we've identified um, and are included on the report that is in your packet. Um, and some of these payroll staffing expenses, I will say, still need to be transferred over to the grants. Um, and we expect to do that shortly, um, which would take care of some of the, the deficits that you may see on the, on the attached report. Um, these include the cost for some building substitutes, in some cases, some of the instructional aids, and certainly the, the custodial staff. Um, and I think that's, you'll kind of see that when you look at the report. Um, but we do anticipate making these accounting adjustments in the very near future. Um, but I would say most of the payroll projections at this time, you know, certainly are, are very close to within budgeted ranges. You may be noticing a, maybe a larger balance in the administration line. That's just due to the delay of the appointment of the assistant superintendent. So we didn't know that that, that was happening and there was going to be some available funds there. Um, but as we enter the start of the second quarter of the fiscal year in October, I do believe we are in some you know, solid financial standing. Um, despite everything that's been going on um, with, the, with the budget and in, in, in COVID-19 and, and some of the new expenses, but we will continue to pursue all available grant funding. And I think right now, uh, certainly leveraging the federal grant funding that we have received to the greatest extent possible. Um, so if you look at, certainly the report is, uh, is shown in two pages, broken down by expenses and payroll on, on page one of the financial report after the narrative. Um, you can see that I've identified at the bottom some COVID-19 expenses that ha have been charged to the general fund um, and have yet to be sort of you know transferred out at this point or journalized out to the the CARES Act funding, which is available to both the town um, and the school department. So I do anticipate that the majority, if not all of these expenses that were essentially occurred during the first quarter of the year, um, some of them were educational materials and supplies and software that was needed, classroom materials that was was needed. Um, technology, certainly technology, software, um, hotspots, some, some cases devices, um, some cases, you know, you know, variety of technology type equipment for instructional equipment for the classroom, um, what were purchased. And then on the facility standpoint, we had several um, cleaning supplies, disinfectant, sanitation, PPE, et cetera. Um, you can see the, the expenses that we did have incurred, and I'm in the process of working with um, town finance director to to identify these avail eligible expenses to be journalized over to the the CARES Act funding, so that the town will receive reimbursement for these. But they're certainly all all eligible for that that area of funding. Um, if you look on page two of the report, the payroll. Um, I don't think there's a lot of surprises here. I think that, um, you know, we, certainly most of payroll is sort of trending in, in, in areas that we budgeted. In the areas that you're, you're seeing deficits, as I spoke to earlier in, in the substitute line item, we're, we're in the process of transferring some of those expenses and um, projections over to 
the the um, the federal grant that's federal grants reopening grant that we've received and identify these expenses to be charged to. So that's certainly the, the case in the substitute line item. It's the case in the custodial line item as we're in the process of doing that, which would certainly take care of take, take care of some of the, the reflected deficits on the on the payroll side of the report. Um, if you look at the page three of the financial report, um, I just wanted to make it clear what are some of the school department COVID-19 sources of funding. Uh, we received three main federal grants um, the school that are school department related. We have the school reopening grant, which is an amount, it was a fixed amount, pure uh, pupil that we received. Right now, these the deadline for this grant is spent expenses through December 31, 2020. And essentially what was identified um, as as a, how we're how we're kind of utilizing the, the, this grant is through um, certainly technology and, and additional computer devices in some cases remote remote learning tools and software and, and, and hotspots for families in need for internet access and so forth um, is is part part of this grant certainly there's some cleaning and sanitation supplies that we've had to um, incur that is written into this grant um, all the major HVAC upgrades and equipment that were done at all of the um, five schools and four campuses have been written into this grant. Um, so those are the majority of the expenses. And on the staffing side, as I spoke to earlier in my narrative, the, the technician, some of the instructional learning aids, uh, building level substitutes, and some of the additional custodial staff are all part of the reopening grant, certainly all related to needs related to COVID-19 and to successfully reopen and safely um, you know, reopen the, the schools in September. Um, and that is, an, you can see the amount there, a little over $521,000. Um, the other grant, uh, Fund Code 113, is the Elementary and Secondary Education Emergency Relief Grant, or otherwise known as the ESSER grant. And again, a federal source where we have until the end of June to expend funds. And this was utilized for an additional school nurse. Um, and that's a little more than $56,900. $97 grant. Um, the third grant that we've received is a remote learning technologies essentials grant. Again, we have until the end of June to expend this grant. It's a little more than 137,000 and, and that was entirely for remote learning devices, Chromebooks, and then again, in some cases, hotspots, internet, Wi-Fi access is how the district is utilizing this, this grant. Um, the last p source of funding, um, was the municipal through the Municipal Cares Act FEMA funding process is a, a source of funding that began back in March, a little more than one point three million dollars, and this is the area that we're working very closely with town officials. Um, certainly, Elizabeth Rourke, town finance director, and Michael Gilberto, town administrator, um, to identify eligible expenses and um, submit those on an ongoing basis for reimbursement. And then reimbursement has already started to flow back to the town um, for this area of funding. And um, you see there in the note, um, the school department did submit for reimbursement of up to a little over $195,000 of expense, eligible expenses related to PPE and cleaning sanitation equipment, as well as technology uh, needs that arose last spring and into the through May and June um, that have already we've already received reimbursement for, and that was last fiscal year. And then we've already submitted two requests um, for ongoing expenses, I'm sort of doing this on every kind of three week cycle um, that we're in the process of waiting to, to, to receive reimbursement and journalize these expenses from one fund to the other. But I'm very hopeful that, 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 that these expenses are certainly clearly eligible and this process will occur very shortly. So certainly, as you know, there's some extra layers of of um, accounting, and, and that is going on right now um, as we address the the, the COVID nineteen uh, situation and the uh, the other available federal sources of funding. Um, but I, you know, I, I I do believe that um, we have worked very hard to kind of. Creatively and strategically um, about how we can utilize this funding and, and do so 
um, to, to leverage the, the, our needs um, to meet the requirements of the grants and the deadlines of the grants, and certainly the, the focus mm -hmm. around safe reopening and, and um, technology, which is certainly key, as we know, and, and certainly s s staff devoted to, to the health with the, the school nurse and safety of the students. Um, as well as cleaning and sanitation and, and HVAC upgrades, as well as additional custodial staff and touch point private cleaning company and so forth, which we've, we've incurred to ensure a, a, um, the, the safety of all st students and staff working in the buildings, um, as well as the, the lear instructional learning aids and so forth that we're continuing to explore and, and, and have written into the grants and the building substitutes to help help um, you know, ensure the, the staff has the support that they need and, and, and the families learning remotely have, have the support that they need as well. Um, so that's essentially the, um, kind of my opening my comments. I'm gonna turn it over to any, any questions. Thank you, Michael. I think I'll just say that uh, we are very fortunate to have you. I think um, you know, it, it's, a lot of districts are struggling right now with funding and I think we take you for granted that we know that you're going to get every grant that's out there and, you know, anticipate, you know, revenue issues. And so I have a lot of confidence in the budget that you, you know, update that you provide us. And I appreciate all that work. I don't have any specific questions. I don't know if anybody at the committee does. No. Thank you for all your hard work, Mike. Yes. Thank you so much, Michael. Yeah. I, I don't have any. Uh, specific questions, but I'll just reiterate. And first of all, Michael, thank you very much for uh, outlining these grants. Uh, you know, I think you know, something I had asked about, um, and um, I, I really appreciate it. And one of the, one of the things that struck me as you were going through all this is that this document is a real sign of how much extra work uh, has been done in the schools since March. So uh, um, it's a real testament to that as well. Um, and I know the. Um, I know the um, the grants the grant process is an, is an extra layer of work as well. I assume when you mean costs being transferred over, you're talking on on an account on the accounting side. Is that what you're? Is that mostly what you're talking about? Yes, correct. Yeah. Making that accounting adjustment from the general fund to the fund that the town's identified for the yep. CARES Act. Okay, that's what I assume. But thanks, M Michael. The only thing outside of the budget here I would ask about is is the LED project complete now? And oh yeah. Are we going to be talking about the solar uh, the solar at some point in time? Do we need to start moving forward with that? Yeah, it's certainly two good questions. So the LED lighting, um, it's essentially complete at four, four um, the, the middle school, high school, the bachelor school, and the little um, school. It's it's complete. Is it, we're just kind of going through some small punch list items just to make sure. Um, there's a couple of small areas with, that need to be addressed in the middle school and the high school. I think there's one little area at the batch, but they, they started um, today at the hood and that's the last school and we're hoping to accelerate that and um, potentially by Friday of this week be completed at the hood school and then it, it would be completed at that point in time. Um, with the solar, so we are certainly um, continuing to ex explore solar um, and kind of revisit that and pick up where things left off last spring. Um, we are working with, uh, at the moment, with RMLD, who submitted a, a request for information um, that was due at, you know, at the end of August. So I'm waiting to get some information. I actually reached out to uh, I'm sorry, at the, at the beginning of September or, or mid-September, I believe, was the, the due date was extended to the mid-September to see uh, what were some of the responses of the interested uh, firms and, develop, and solar developers that took part in that process. The idea is that if, if we have some uh, projects that look like they make sense for both the town and the schools, we, we increase the, the, the eligible real estate um, for solar, because we, we kind of realize that we, you know, if we want the, the revenue to be as advantageous as we can, we, we need to look at certainly all areas in the community. Um, so the next step is to kind of analyze th those results. And then if, if things seem like it, it makes sense and there's a project there that's beneficial, we would submit an official, um, another official RFP at that point. And at that point, it might involve more 
than just the middle school and the high school. It might involve um, other areas of, of school buildings as well as town. And we would, and we're trying to work a little bit more, more hand in hand with RMLD, given that they're the third party that has to be involved, given it's a closed franchise, um, to make all these contracts work. So that's kind of the approach we're we're taking now. Um, I have not heard back from our RMLD in my inquiry about a week ago, so I need to kind of continue to follow up with them to find out what some of that data showed in the RFI that they submitted. That we that we agreed to take part in um, with Michael Gilberto's assistance. We were we were both on calls with RMLD back back in August about it. So thank you very much. Just wanted to add one thing again. Thank you to Michael for this and for the everyone in the town and the finance planning team for helping us with this. The positions that we were able to get through the grants, I think it's important just to point out these are positions that have been in our budget for many years. The additional custodian, the additional nurse. Um, I'm not sure what the situation is going to be in terms of grants for after December 31st or into next year, but you know I, I just think it's important to say it's going to be a difficult budget year. But a lot of these positions are ones that we hope we can sustain because they they've always been necessities, they've always been needs, they've just been non-negotiables this year in COVID. But these aren't necessarily items that just came up because of COVID. These are things that have been out there for many years. So it's just important for everyone to to recognize that, and we hope that we can find a way to support. Uh, some of these great positions that are that are making our schools better. You know, having a technician now for devices K to 12, having an extra custodian for all of the things that need to be done inside and outside of the school, and for that for the numbers that we have for having that additional nurse and the floating nurse, it, it's especially important this year. But I think certainly in general, with the numbers we have, it's been justified for quite some time. So I just wanted to make sure that was clear as well. Thank you. Okay. On the bids and donations, Mr. McGowan, would you like to lead us in this? Yes, uh, we have one. I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a mini grant. I think they shouldn't sell themselves short, but a mini grant totaling $500 from Salem State University to be used for STEM week preparation at North Reading Public Schools. We have a second. I'll second. Um, we'll do a roll call vote. Rich? Aye. Janine? Aye. I'm an uh, oh, sorry, Chris. Aye. I'm an I as well. Five or four zero. I'm losing it here. That's the only bid and donation we have tonight, I think. That is it. Okay. And we'll move on to subcommittee updates. Um, for that I will just say that for finance planning team, I think Mr. McGowan can correct me if I'm wrong, but it was primarily about town side stuff, um, particularly the Warren articles. Um, for a town meeting, and that's yeah. about it. I don't think there was anything notable for the school side. Correct. Uh, committee schedule, we have an athletic subcommittee meeting on October 16th at 12.30 p.m. virtually. Actually, actually, I'm sorry, that should be the 14th. Both of those are the 14th, I believe. The 14th, I meant, at 12.30 yeah. p.m. virtually. Well, and fine arts subcommittee right after that at 3.30 p.m. virtually. <laughs> Administrative report, anything, Dr. Daly? Not at this time, I think I covered it all earlier. And any correspondence? None at this time. So our next meeting is going to be October 19th. Yes. And we'll do the same thing. We'll do a hybrid at 6.30 p.m. And then we have meetings on November 5th and November 19th afterwards. Correct. And if there's any no other comments, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. I'll second. Okay. And we'll do a roll call vote for that. Janine. Aye. Rich. Aye. Chris. Aye. I'm an I as well. Thank you, everybody. Pass the 4 0. Good night, everyone, and go Patriots. Good night. And don't, tell Good night. Me, don't tell me the score. Don't tell me the score, anybody. <laughs> Bye, all.